Whether learning by doing works depends on two things, what you're learning and what you're doing. And there's basically two cases. Either you're doing pretty much what you're trying to learn, which most people would call practice, or you're doing one thing and you're trying to learn something else, which we can call indirect learning for lack of a better word. The rest of this video is about how learning by doing works in each one of these cases. Let's take the practice case first. Suppose you are learning tennis. Well, at least some part of your time has to be spent playing tennis. I don't think I'm shocking anyone here. Just sitting and watching other people play tennis or, I don't know, reading a book about how to play tennis is not going to cut it. In this sense, of course, learning by doing works, but how well it works depends on exactly what we're doing. So there are different kinds of practice and depending on how you practice, you might get better or worse results. So spaced practice beats mass practice. Interleaved practice beats block practice. Deliberate practice beats regular practice. I've already made other videos talking about some of these ideas, which I will link in the description below. Let's talk about case number two, the indirect learning case, which is a bit trickier. Now we're gonna look at several examples to try to suss out when learning by doing is a good thing and when it's actually kind of worthless. Here's the first scenario. Your goal is to teach students a mathematical problem solving technique, say integration by parts. Option one is to show them how the technique works with a few examples and then have them practice for a little bit. Option two is to give them some problems where they have to discover this technique as they solve the problem. In this case, I like option one. It's highly unlikely that students are going to discover integrating by parts on their own. And even if they did, by the time that they figured this out, they would have spent a long, long time thinking about stuff that is completely irrelevant to what you want them to learn. The lesson here is that being explicit is really important. If you're not explicit, it's a little bit like asking students to guess what you want them to learn. I always hated when teachers did that. Here's another example. Suppose you are trying to teach students about the concept of ratio. Now option one is to walk them through this example of ratios and give them some more examples and explain what it's about. Option two is to ask them to study this situation with these clowns in these train cars and try to explain the difference between these different trains in terms of a number, then explain the concept of ratio and give them some more examples. In this case, I like option two. There's actually a study that compares these two conditions and the students in option two learned the idea more deeply and could transfer it more effectively to other kinds of problems. The lesson here is that prior knowledge is really important. Sometimes learning by doing works by giving students an experience that lets them understand what you are telling them. This is the preparation for future learning model, which I have an old YouTube video about here. Let's look at two more examples of learning by doing. Volcanoes. Everybody loves making those paper mache volcanoes as a kid. You put the baking soda in it and well, you know the deal. Here's another activity that's kind of similar. Students build a model of a heart with uh, straws and a bunch of other stuff. Now at first glance, both of these activities seem like fun in class activities that get students thinking about a scientific topic. But there's an important difference between the two. With a volcano, students are making something that looks like a volcano, but does not behave like a volcano. So the process leading to the paper mache volcanic eruption really has nothing to do with the process of, of an actual volcanic eruption. But with the model heart, students are making something that superficially looks nothing like a real heart, but operates at least in some important ways like a real heart. This at least opens the door for students to use the model heart as an analogy to a real heart and to test hypotheses about how a real heart works. Now, is it worth that class time to spend building the heart instead of just giving the model to the students? I think that depends on how much the students are learning as they are building, how much they are learning about 
how the mechanism works. My point is just that learning by doing is complicated, and it makes no sense to say that learning by doing is automatically good or automatically bad. People who advocate learning by doing are often making an implicit argument that students spend too much time sitting there passively listening or reading and not enough time, you know, interacting, getting out there and doing stuff. There are lots of cases like this where teachers spend so much time explaining things to students without students actually getting practice at the key skills or maybe not even being prepared to understand what the teacher is saying. It's like explaining how to do surgery and then expecting that students will be able to actually perform surgery. But if you think that learning by doing is automatically good, you fall into the other trap. So students can spend all this time making things and building things, but not actually learn what you want them to learn. Maybe they're having fun, or maybe they're not, but they're probably spending too much time getting their fingers caked with cornstarch to learn anything. There is so much more to say about this topic, but I want to hear from you in the comments. Tell us some cases where learning by doing worked for you, or maybe some cases where it didn't. Thanks everyone. Peace.